Yeah, thanks guys. We appreciate it. See some familiar faces. Walker. This, today's a little different than the past. We are going to be um, actually broadcasting internet streaming live right now through uh, user. Uh, I recently uh, signed a contract to have my own um, internet streaming uh, radio show. My first show was last Friday. So uh, that's got me in touch with a lot of technology now, which I'm so grateful for. Um, and I'm going to share that with Teen Summit. So tonight's session will be available on um, a server website. So I'll give you that one before we're done. Um, and also give you the um, website link for my shows on Friday. Because we're going to be talking about all the different concepts and stories and strategies that I use. I'm going to interview a lot of the athletes that are my clients, as well as some that aren't. Uh, not that I don't want them to be. <laughs> Uh, but they're, they're, they'll come in and talk about different aspects of uh, their life as a professional athlete, as well as talk about the business side of things, the familial side of things, about the environment and what family members, how important they are to the, the life of the athlete and what that means to them. Um, but today, we're going to focus on today, focus on the now. It's about dreaming and the dreams and making them reality. Um, we've talked about it before. But I'm going to ask you to, to open your mind up a little bit more and be more specific about how you dream, why you dream. Um, maybe you think you don't dream and you're wondering why you're talking about dreaming. Because I know at an older age, I talk to a lot of adults, my adult athletes and adult executives. And, ah, I don't dream. I, I barely get to sleep the way it is. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not sure I dream at all. And if I do, I don't remember that. Well, we do. Everybody dreams. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about why it's important to be uh, attentive to your dreams and focus on your dreams and how they impact your performance as an athlete. Um, this group up here is a group of athletes that were, uh, many of them, the first time they noticed their body postures, their first time they ever were in the ocean. This was in Hawaii at uh, CSU Carl State University football team went out there to play uh, against the University of Hawaii team. Uh, they, they do it every year. Um, this was the first time that this group had got, we actually traveled to Hawaii, and we took an extra day to plan for the impact of travel on their minds, on their bodies. We actually had 300 pound linemen walking up and down the aisle of the airplane to make sure they stayed active and didn't take, didn't sleep. We wanted to make sure they were, Cicadic rhythms were in, in line, they weren't out of, out of track and off, off cycle with that. So this is them, as you can tell, these three young men, never been in the ocean before. Um, and uh, had a great time being there. So for them, being out there, dreaming was um, a, a awakened moment. They were dreaming about what they, where they'd been, where they'd not been, and that's, that slogan, that statement I put up there um, is imagine, imagine you may see them, and if you see them, you can take action on them and act on them to create a reality. So that's, what, that's where our theme is today, is to look at your dreams, embrace your dreams, and try to make them a reality. That if you can see them clearly, it's very, you're going to get really, really close to making your dreams a reality. <clears throat> One of the questions I've asked you guys a lot is who are you? And why are you on that hill? Why are you on your skis? Why is it important to you? So when you look at yourself on the mountain, do you see these things? Do you dream about yourself being like these pictures that are up there? Well, and then the question I would ask you then is why not? Or how much of what that picture looks like could be you? Okay. So that's kind of the, the question for you then, is to find out what that image is for yourself. And to do that, you've got to accept failure, resiliency. What that means is resiliency is, I didn't do it quite the way I wanted to, and I got to figure it out really quickly, and then try it again. Now sometimes, 
as a skier or a snowboarder, you get to wait till the end of the mountain when <laughs> you're done, and you can think about it and, and go try it again, and then try it again. But when you're in a race, you're in a competition, and you're going around a gate, and you feel it kind of chattering on you, you gotta fix it right then and there. Because you know if I don't correct that, I'm gonna lose time. I'm not gonna go fast enough. Did it really? Simple. So you were in the moment, right in the now. And resiliency is the ability to overcome failure. And to do that, you've got to be pretty mentally tough. Your brain's got to be focused in on things. And if you can get in touch with your dreams and be mentally tough, you're going to help yourself by getting those dreams to a point of reality for yourself. The other piece is humble. What's humble? Anybody know what humble is? Yeah. Happy? Well, I think I know some humble people that aren't very happy, but there are a lot of people that are happy and humble. What's humble? Wait, mumble is like when you're talking. Right, that's the mumble. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. This is humble. <laughs> it's also known as humility. So if you if, about your humility. <laughs> yeah. So if you're if you're wrong, have you ever been wrong before? We're not quite done it the way you wanted to. How did that make you feel? Uh, I didn't feel proud of myself as I wanted to. Yeah. Did you want to talk about it to anybody? No. Yeah. So humility is when you start to talk about it. You're not worried about that you made a mistake. You really are anxious. If you're really humble, you're really anxious about talking about it. Because you want to get it fixed. I, I, I want my coach to tell me, did I do this wrong? Because I think I did it wrong. That's a humble person making that statement. That's a, hum that's a person that is confident with themselves, so confident with themselves that they're going to ask for help. Yes, ma'am? Is it the opposite of boasting? Or is it more a confidence that maybe, like what's kind of hit? Is it the opposite of humble or the opposite of what's, what's good? Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good question to ask because Giving them a counterexample is sometimes even more meaningful as far as learning it. But I, I hesitate to say that it's yeah. the opposite of boasting. Because I also talk about swagger and give, giving, you know, you gotta get out there and have an attitude, you know, and get on your skis and get after it. Doesn't matter what's in front of you, you just gotta plow right through it. And some might say that's a little boastful. So the opposite of humble is sometimes ignorance, it's sometimes reluctance. And so what I tend to say is the opposite of humility is a combination of things that causes you not to move forward fast enough. And so if it's, if it's a lack of truthfulness with yourself, that's not very humble. If it's an act of, hey, being too boastful, you're clouding your judgment. You're not seeing yourself for who you really are and moving forward and being humble enough to admit that and move on. So there's whole myriad of stuff that I deal with that. so I can't really put one label on it for what's opposite. So being humble is telling the truth to yourself and then going and asking for help. You were very close and sometimes I mumble when I talk about it. <laughs> so this next word, integrity. What's, what's integrity mean? If I'm a high integrity person, what am I? Yeah, you know what? That's a really that's a really great phrase. I commend your school for that because you up here at your schools you have an integrity program throughout middle school or elementary school all the way to high school, and that's exactly right. That's a good common phrase for everybody to be aware of. That here here's something. I the last time I was here, I, I got here early and I was walking around, and I got some coffee and I was walking back and I saw a cup in the middle of the sidewalk. And there's a few people in front of me, and they walked right by it. Well, they didn't drop the cup. The cup was already there. But what you said to me, you said, doing the right thing when nobody's around. And see, that cup was there on the ground. I didn't put it there. The people that were in front of me that walked right by it, they didn't put it there, because I saw them. They didn't drop it. But they didn't pick it up either. So what's the right thing? Especially in Frisco, Colorado. <laughs> Green footprint, right? <laughs> well, 
They didn't pick it up. I picked it up and put it in the trash can. That's the right thing to do. I didn't care if anybody saw me do it. And the only reason I'm telling you now is it's an example of integrity. Another way of looking at integrity is if you say it, you do it. If you tell your coach you're going to show up, you show up. If you tell your coach, I'm going to be there early, coach, because I want your help, would you be there early and you show up earlier than what you asked for? That's really high integrity. What you say, you do. That's integrity. Now, here's where the dreams come in. You want to make them connected. All of these things I just mentioned here about getting you to an image that you believe is what you want to look like on the mountain, coming through the gates, going over the different obstacles that are on the, on the course. You want to make sure they're connected. So integrity is connected to being humble. Mental toughness is connected to being uh, high integrity. Resiliency is connected to humility. So understanding how all those things are connected. That's what we're going to try to get to today, is talking about dreams and how to make those connections. Making connections to your dream. Anybody have a dream they want to share? Anybody have a dream recently? Yeah? You know, I can count on you. I can count on you. What was the dream? The dream that I had was getting first, but that did not happen. Okay, but you had a dream. We'll stay on the dream. Okay, we'll, go, we'll talk about reality later. So you had a dream about being first in today's race, right? Being top ten. Top ten, okay. How, can we stay at number one? Sure. And we'll get to the top ten a little later. So you wanted to be number one in that top ten look, right? Did you have an image of what that looked like to be number one? Well, not, not really too many. Okay, but did you get any more specific? Was there a certain thing that looked like when you went around it? Is there a slalom? Super cheap. Super cheap. Okay, so you're going through gates, right? Well, I was going, I was thinking of the job because I said that. Okay, so that you were thinking about things you're not that good at. All right, so you're trying to envision that, right? Did you have a, a feeling at all? Did you, yeah, so did you get so into the dream you could feel the wind going through your goggles? No. It wasn't that good, huh? Close though? Could you could you smell the snow? No. <laughs> Did you feel the temperature in your dream? No. You see where I'm going here? If you really are into your dreams, if you really are, are aware of who you are, you feel all of those things. I want to focus on sleeping. <laughs> I would focus on sleeping too. That's a good thing to do. And that's okay. But I'm gonna get to hope you're gonna be with me on the dreaming part, right? making the connections so that we can connect to all of those feelings. Because one of the first things is imagining this, imagining your number one, which answers that question that's up there. Why am I here? I have a question. Are you talking about dreams when you're asleep or dreams when you're awake? That's a good question. A little preemptive. Because we're going to get there. Okay. So both. I'm just yes, both. <laughs> And that's why I'm going to want to go through these examples with these words that hopefully make the connection. So when you're actually dreaming while you're standing, how many have been accused of daydreaming? <laughs> okay, be honest, people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially when we were kids. Maybe we're doing it to our own kids. Would you just please wake up? <laughs> We've got, we have our children that might be that way. And there's not, so what I'm also telling you is there's nothing wrong with dreaming as long as you keep it in perspective of who are you and why are you here? Keep it in line with what, what's happening. The next thing is taking action on those dreams and making those connections. So as I was asking her about number one, top 10, and making the connections so you could actually see the elements of yourself going down the mountain and what it looks like to be number one, because I'm guessing your coach is probably telling you certain things about what it, what it you should look like on the hill to go faster. Yeah, see, they say about your tucks, they say about your down, downhill ski, they talk about your hips, they talk about all kinds of different pieces, right? When you put all those pieces together, when you make that connection, it starts to create a picture. Well, picture your mind about your skiing. And then the last thing is that reality, the finishing number one, finishing in the top ten. And, and after
asking yourself then, in that dreaming part, in that imaginary part, whether you're awake or asleep, what do I want? So my triangle is going to take all these words and put it into an image. So that's the dream. The whole triangle set up is a dream. And the first piece is the image, that vision you're going to get about, like you said, I want to be number one. I want to be top ten. Okay? The next piece, they're kind of connected. It's kind of, this line should be a little blurry. Because when you take action on it to get to the reality, some of us get a little faster. <laughs> we want to get to the reality in our mind before it actually happens. And we, we go too fast, and that's the point where you make mistakes. You're not in the moment. You're not in the now and, and pushing that action that was created in that vision in your head to the reality that you want. So that's why I say to my athletes, every single slice, every single moment. So as you as a skier or a snowboarder, you're going over um, an obstacle, you're going around a gate, you're, you're seeing, you're literally seeing all the pieces, you're feeling every single movement around that gate. And that would be the ultimate reality of that dream because you've taken that dream into those specific things. And then you have success. <laughs> and you have to say something here. The success of whatever you define it to be. Okay? It may not be number one. It may not even be a finish. It might be that you succeeded to getting through the gates of the level you wanted to get through them. Because everybody's different into their degree of talent. You know, we've got some we've got some young people here. You know, not everybody's a medal winner, right? <laughs> Walker's one of you, that's why I think Walker. He's been doing pretty good lately. But all of you do good. So take little pieces. It's not about the finish of the race necessarily. It's about how you go through the process. So when you dream about what you want to do and you have a vision of how you want to succeed, think about all the little pieces. All right. So that's kind of our introduction. Now here's the part where I define what dreaming is. Dreams provide a world in which we escape from reality into the mind and seemingly have little control over what happens. But what if you didn't know you were dreaming and subsequently control the dream? It turns out lucid dreaming is highly possible. And with a little effort and practice, even you can do it. Now some of you might be saying, I don't even dream. But the truth is, everybody has about three to seven dreams a night. The problem is we quickly forget them. The first strategy towards lucid dreaming is keeping a dream journal. Keeping a journal improves your ability to recall dreams and helps facilitate lucidity. So every time you wake up, write down what you remember, even if it's nothing, just to form a habit. The next step is to form a reality. In a dream, something as simple as reading a sentence, counting your fingers, or checking the time can often go astray. Try it right now. Look at the time, look away, and then look back. Assuming you aren't currently dreaming, the time probably stays the same. However, in a dream, the time or the words we are reading will often completely change. The key is to do these reality checks often when you're awake. This way, they become second nature, and when you're dreaming, you're likely to perform the same test and realize that something is wrong. After this comes a technique known as mnemonically induced lucid dreams, or MILE. As you're falling asleep, begin to think of a recent dream and imagine yourself becoming lucid. The idea is to reinforce the intention to realize the dream.
Okay, so let me let me kind of summarize that. Got a lot of stuff there. I'm going really fast. Okay. Lucid dreams. Those are the dreams that you clearly see them. And that can happen both when you're awake and when you're asleep. Like at the end there, it says, Are you really dreaming? There's a, there's a continuum between awake and asleep. And really, you know, I, I was driving here and I think I was dreaming. <laughs> I didn't imagine anything. I didn't see any you know, creatures coming out of the snow on the side of the road. But, I, you know, you, we, what we call daydream. And that's also the term for lucid dreaming. And then you have the wild and the mild stuff. So for you guys, all of you guys, do you dream? Have you, have you dreamed? Do you dream? Do you dream? Do you dream? Sometimes. Do you dream? Do you dream? Do you dream? Do you remember them? Sometimes? No? I do. You do? Okay. Who dreams in color of the kids? Sometimes? Well, raise your hand. Dream in color. Okay. Now, the reason I'm doing this with you guys instead of mom and dad is because mom and dad on the mild and wild stuff regarding lucid dreams really encourage the kids to journal. So if they, if they buy into the dreaming, three by five cards, a little notebook, whatever, draw a picture, but they don't have to you know, have complete sentences. They don't have to have anything make sense as long as they make some kind of effort to start that journaling process. And they were pretty organized in their little, little graphic for journaling. But journaling is also something that is very therapeutic from a standpoint of, of thought recognition and thought protocol so that you cognitively start to organize things into place. Now, here's the benefit for moms and dads and the kids. They might become a little bit more organized with a lot of other things that they're not really organized with, like picking their stuff up. <laughs> they set a whole other set of priorities because their brain, they're starting to practice thinking with their brain and training their brain to put things into buckets. Now, the degree of that varies from child to child. <laughs> so don't, don't be too overly excited about how big it's going to get. Very, very small stuff. But encourage them to journal so that you can make a distinction for them about the mild versus the wild. Now, I'm sure that, I won't assume it, but I'm sure there's going to be a, some of us that have had the kids wind up in the bedroom with you at night because something scared them. They had a, a bad dream. You know, we call it a bad dream. Well, it may not have been a bad dream. It may have been, been just startling or scary. And the reason that happens is because there was experiences in the waking awakened life about trying to make things real. They meet a new person. They have a new experience. Then they go to sleep that night. And because of their desire wanting to perform at a high level, that causes all of the chemistry in our brain to start doing things and creating thoughts, which is where we get the wild side of things. Now, I'm oversimplifying it great because you don't want to get into the neuroscience and cognitive therapy with me here. <laughs> even though I spent one of my favorite time studying it. Um, but I have athletes, for example, I have an uh, Olympic wrestler, a uh, freestyle Olympic wrestler, who uh, dreams graphically in color, and, and many of his uh, dreams are so startling, he, he jumps out of bed and walks around his room and he doesn't know it for a few minutes. He's, he's ADHD, um, and so, so severely it's, it's borderline bipolar. And he has a strong desire, like many of these young people, that don't want, he don't want to be medicated. So that's another challenge. It's hard to keep him in a high performance state if he doesn't want to be medicated at all. So for me, and I agree with him. I don't make it take exception to that at all. Um, so our training is to get him to really get in touch with his dreams. I mean, he has people with guns and machetes things, and he hears knocking in the night kind of thing. That, so it's really scary for, for him to then take me seriously about, hey, wrap your arms around that tree. Bring it in close. <laughs> hey, say, be friendly with it. Well, he says, it's kind of scary. So when you have your dreams, see them. As it said in the, in the thing about dreaming, wrap your arms around it, your brain around it. You know, pretend that when you dream, pretend that you're almost awake looking at the dream from outside. Okay? So here's some practice. Can you practice with me? Okay, close your eyes. Be real comfortable in your chair. So you gotta stop eating your crackers and your food. For just a second. Just hold them in your hand. Yeah, look, I, I know. It's, it's a great cracker, right? <laughs> <laughs> so close your eyes. And I want you to start thinking about a really special place. Whatever that place is. It could be the chair you're sitting in, the, the, the way it feels, or a real special place. And think about that. 
and start making as many details about that place as you can. Now, as you do that, I want you to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth as, as smoothly and as quietly as you can so that you feel really, really comfortable. And that, that breathing starts to help you with any movement or rhythm that you see in those images. I'm going to help you a little bit with some images with color, like a really rich green color, or a nice kind of orange to tan to yellow color. And things are swaying back and forth like a cool breeze is moving through the trees. So you bring in any images that you want into that dream and see the details. Can you see pine needles in the tree? Can you see the bark? Can you feel things? If you're starting to do some of those things, you're in a place where you're starting to have more of that mild dreaming state that's lucid because you're awake really right now, but you are actually dreaming. If it's difficult for you to get to that place right now and see those details and smooth out the breathing and see all those wonderful things in color, then you've got some practice to do. So I'll ask you to open your eyes now. Now that we've gone through that little exercise, did anybody get to the detail and see some of the detail? Did you? <laughs> Was it your mom? <laughs> okay, so you're, that's a practice that you can do every night before you go to bed. So mom and dad, in addition to the journaling, ask your, your son or daughter to sit on the edge of their bed, close their eyes. It takes about three minutes to do this. And get them in that breathing state. Get them into that seeing things. And, and end, basically, we're ending the day with positivity. It's, it's a more in-depth, positive self-talk. And that will help them start to clear the day out. So if there are any downturns, <laughs> failures, if you will, errors, they're, they're going to be in a place where they're going to feel better about that day. Yes. Are we going to create the imagery, or are they going to talk about what they're taking? That, that's, that's, a, that's a choice I give to the kids. I ask them to minimally journal it. Um, it's their choice whether they share that with you or not. But at, at younger ages, they want to they share and encourage them to share. Give, but it's their choice, because there's also the private side of dreaming, things that bother them, upset them, um, and they, they've got to find a place to move to that's filled with the confidence to be able to verbalize what they've seen. Because sometimes the confusion of dreaming is the reason why they don't share. They're trying to order it out in their head. Uh, but dreaming is a very, very powerful tool to not only understand the adolescent mindset, but also to get that competitor locked in line with what's really good for them, that they buy into, take ownership of, and then they'll be freer on the, on the, on the snow or the course or the track or the field. And one more question. Yes, ma'am. Is when, when we see them before they're, um, when they're ready, ready for the race and at the top of the hill, we see a lot of them each doing their thing before going through the course. That's problematic. Oh, that's really? problematic. I would think that would be like their detail, like they're thinking uh -huh. about the detail. Com it's counterintuitive. Um, here's, here, I'll give you the example, come back to my athlete, my wrestler. He, um, his anxiety was so bad, uh, and by the way, he was a very competitive wrestler, high school and standard college wrestling, very, very good. Um, so it amazed me that he survived at the level of performance that he did, because when he would get to the mat, the closer and closer it got to him being on the mat and competing, blackness would come in and come to a point where it was a tunnel. So all he saw was the athlete in front of him. Everything around him was black. And as he wrestled, that blackness would move and change. So for him to actually perform on the mat and make moves and secure points was, was amazing. So that, that was a result of him not being able to manage all of the thoughts. So what would happen with him, he'd be like this. He'd come into the mat be all scrunched over like this instead of seeing the details. So now he takes walks every morning, every night with the intention of just seeing the details of his neighborhood. Cracks in the walls, uh, the leaves on the trees, the breeze, and feeling the breeze, breeze on his arm, the sunshine, the warmth. He's in Arizona, he's in Phoenix. So there's lots of different things that you can see on a daily basis. So I encourage kids to start their day and end their day with perspective. And, and at night, when they close their eyes, it's they create that perspective themselves and bring everything through the day into that dream state. So when they go to bed, 
they're in a place chemically that they started in a positive way. Not your own guarantees, they still should, could have bad dreams, but at least they've started off in a positive way into that. And we'll be able to hope, hopefully start managing that, that, that state. So breathing is a key thing. The daily meditation, which is that, I'm giving you a small start in that, that go to bed at night, wake up in the morning is the next piece. Is don't, <laughs> as much as we want them to bound out of bed, get their clothes on, and run down to the table, eat breakfast, and go to school, um, there should be a moment of getting it started. So reverse the, at night, do it in the morning. So get, help them to coach themselves into, swing your legs off the bed, sit there for a minute, Big breath in, big breath out. Before you get off the bed and go to do the stuff mom and dad want you to do, think of one, one positive thing. You need three positives if you have a negative. Oh. Good memory. This is just start your day. I want you to start your day with at least one positive. So for me, it's when I swing my legs off the side of the bed, and I sit there and take that big breath in. My, my first positive, every day, my first positive, I'm glad I'm alive. I'm so pleased to be here. Glad I'm alive. I change the words every once in a while, but it's pretty the essence is I'm glad I'm here. All right, so one positive, at least one positive to start the day, and then move from there. The journaling, more we can get them to write it down, there's three very positive, uh, very strong things about cognitive retention. See it, say it, read it, or see it, say it, write it. Do those three things. If you want people to retain information, see it, say it, write it. So if we can get them to journal, take notes. Just for the computer set, is there a difference between writing it and typing it? No. Um, it's that char characterization. Of a thought, so whether it's the typed words, I've even I've even added audio recording as a compromise because there are some some kids, kids some of my kids are 25 years old and older, um, and they're so conditioned to the technology we have that they they write notes by recording. They won't they won't type it, uh, so. I want them to get in those three modalities as much as we can so that they can have greater attention and can eventually uh, take control of themselves. Can you say that we control our, our journey? Usually we're journey through our thinking. So it's like our thinking. Okay, good, que good question, good thought. So here's what, here's what I mean by it. If your dreams are random, her question was, my dreams are random, so how, how do I control my dreams? It's when you, when you feel and see those random dreams, Get yourself into them and control them. Okay, so that one goes by. Then you have another random dream. Get into that dream, and control means you see the details. Okay, so when you have a dream, try to feel it and see it and get in it and see all the details. That's what I meant by control. Does that help? Okay. Oh, sorry, let's go back. No. Practice. This is the phrase I have from all of my athletes. And I ask them to fill in the blank. It's all about you. Exactly. Why is that? Because when you're in the starting gate, what, what do you think you do? Um, GS and slalom. Okay, so let's take the slalom because it's uh, moving around, right? So you're at the gate, you're getting ready to go, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else up there with you? Uh, my coach. Anybody else in your ski boots with you? In my ski boots? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody ride on your ski boots with you? Nobody behind you controlling your sticks, right? Yeah. Okay. Anybody oh. next to you telling yeah. you what to do? No. So it's... You. So at that moment, it's all about you. Yeah. And that's why when you dream, when you practice, when you train, it's got to be about you. So at the end of the mountain, if, if you are low integrity and not very humble, you'll say things like, Coach, it's your fault. You didn't tell me what to do. Dad, why didn't you wake me up this morning? 
that would be a not a very humble person. And that's why this is for champions, why this is so important. It's all about you. It's all about you. So how do we get there? How do you get to that reality? Well, have those lucid thoughts, that, that dreaming, that real life dream. So that <clears throat> the question that was asked earlier, lucid dreaming is both could be awake, could be asleep. And everybody's different is the degree that you are asleep or awake as to how much dreaming you're doing. For some of us as kids, we're dreaming all the time. <laughs> we get stopped by that constantly. Pay attention. Sit up straight. Stop doing that. Give me a piece of food. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, you're, I'm just kidding. I'm just, no, seriously, I'm just kidding. I knew she would. I knew she would. Here you go. Thank you very much. And see what, what she's doing is positivity. In addition to helping the instructor with his confidence and self-control by not gripping any of this on himself, so he's going to stay focused. Notice how I'm segueing here? This is great. So I have to without <laughs> Successfully finish eating that without making myself look like a slob. <clears throat> now all of this is aligned to what do you what do you want out of this? Like you said earlier, you wanted to be number one or the top ten. You had some goals, right? <clears throat> but at this time, how old are you? Ten. ten. So at ten years old, do you think you're going to be a, a number one that is equal to being an Olympic gold medalist? Is that the number one you're talking about? Right. Why not? Why why can't you be a, why can't your number one be an Olympic gold medalist? She doesn't have enough practice. She hasn't practiced as much as the Olympians. See, there's different degrees. So your goals have to align with your skills and all of these things. You're at different places. So some people dream about, I'm going to be an Olympian. That's awesome. I hope you are. But let's put some reality to it, right? More practice, maybe get a little stronger, listen to my coach. Make sure that I'm doing the things I need to do. I have high integrity. I'm humble. All of the things we've talked about so far. And add in the emotions of positivity, being confident, that swagger, that I'm good. I'm good. I'm really good. Oh, yeah. It's definitely. That's right. <laughs> so there's my slogan. You have to imagine it. You have to be in that dreaming place to get it all started. Get the juices flowing, get the energy going, so that you can believe, not with just part of you, not with just some of you, but with your entire essence, which is why, why I say up there, with all my heart. It's all, it's all about you. That's right. So you're in. You're all in. I've imagined it. I'm believing it. So I can achieve it. Now here, <clears throat> as much as I put these things up and I use words, I try to give you examples about the reality of it. Because words aren't worth anything except the paper ink that they have put them into that place, unless you know how to take action with those words. How do I imagine, which is what we're talking about, dreaming, and that it exists, and how you can manage it and put it in perspective. I'm going to believe. What are the things that help me believe? Yes, ma'am. Thinking about what I'm doing. Okay, but. Oh, and also think about me. Think about what? I'm thinking about me. Well, that's good, because you should think about it. But if I imagine something, I had a dream about being an Olympian. And I'm going to believe it. What keeps my belief going? What keeps me? I get up every morning believing I'm, I'm good. Because some days you might get up and go, I'm so sure I feel so good. So what, what gives you the, that belief to keep going? Is it failure? Does failure help you keep believing? 
sometimes. Depends how big the failure is, right? So success, things that you've accomplished, talking to your friends, talking to mom and dad. By the way, uh, of, the, of the kids here, how many of you said thank you to mom or dad today? Um, I'll be honest. I did once okay. or twice. Okay. Saying thank you and showing appreciation to those around you that support you is a huge way of reinforcing the belief part that you believe. Because if you believe, you're aware of others around you. <clears throat> Which is why this is up here. The say it part, I'll give you an example of the say it part. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Hey, Coach. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being around. You're an awesome person. Can't say guy or girl because I'm not sure what coach is yet. But you gotta say it. And then you go out and do it. Then you show the appreciation by actually doing the stuff on your skis, on your snowboard, and get the job. Anybody know anybody that wants it to happen but it never really does for them? Really? Okay. Mm. How many people do you know that wish it happens? You did that too? Okay. Well, look, that's important. All those things are important. But some people just stop there. And then when you put those two together, and you take the action to make your dream a reality, you make it happen. You do what's necessary to make it happen. Here's who said that. I took this picture on this. Take a pause. Just felt really, really old. <laughs> <laughs> I, exactly, exactly. Take a big. Oh my gosh! I might sit down. Not even a knee. So for our audience out there that's, gonna, that's seeing this live, and some of them are, we were asked, "Who's Michael Jordan?" Well, Michael Jordan is one of the best, if not still the best. NBA basketball players of our time. This picture was taken on December 24th in Chicago against the Detroit Pistons, and I was literally from here to the screen away from it, taking the picture sitting with my camera, my, my 10 year old son next to me. This was in 1991. This is John, John Sally, uh, who was pretty good at his own right. And he admitted later on, when he, after he retired, he regretted that he had always get matched up against Michael Jordan when they played. Because he was the best physical size and talent to match up against. But Michael was, uh, he was unbelievably just tacky, keep after him all the time, all the time, all the time. And he, it doesn't mean he, he ever, he won every time, but he kept at you, kept at you. His resiliency was unbelievable. I have other pictures of him. Um, he, he always wore his North Carolina, University of North Carolina, powder blue shorts. And back in those days, the shorts were like there. <laughs> so he wore liners down here because the shorts were so short uh, when he warmed up pregame. And he would be there so early, he would shoot uh, anywhere from 150 to 300 shots before every game. I mean, he just was an amazing, amazing commitment to the game and to his uh, sport. Put it all together. Put it all together. That means put your dream together to get to a reality. And here's a story, uh, not a true story, but true to some, of Another sport.
golf. Um, the story ends with uh, the golfer um, winning the tournament. Uh, it was back in the 30s when, you know, spending any money, let alone for something recreational like golf, was prohibited. You just couldn't do it. You know, people were starving, um, you know, doing things that they never thought they would do. You know, store owners that lost their stores because they, you know, just bankruptcy. You know, things went bad. So here's a, here's a black man who knows the game of golf brought this young man back to a point where he wins the championship but fulfills the dream of a young boy who loves the game of golf. His dad would chastise him, beat him because he found him on the golf course instead of you know, chopping wood or gathering apples or food or whatever for the house. And because of this event, the three came together shared something and made a connection about what they wanted to do for themselves, the dreams they had for themselves. And it's because they inter their, their interaction that they overcame many different things throughout the game, the 18 holes of golf, and uh, getting coming up to it in the practice because the, the golfer was an alcoholic. He was a champion golfer before the war. Then he went off to the war and came back a different person because of what he'd seen. So he was, he was kind of a, he was doing okay compared to most during the time because his family had a, a big, big estate. He was living in the old house and was da dilapidated, but he took into drinking alcohol and not being the best of citizens. And this opportunity came along and pulled him out so he could go back to see his dreams. So even with that failure, but surrounding himself with people who cared about him, who didn't really know him, he succeeded. And his dreams were renewed. And the reality of the dream became true. Now, the three golf, the two other golfers that were, that were in this movie, they're, all three of them are reality. There, there's a whole story about this tournament and, and the winning and, the, and everything. But for me, it's, it's an epic moment about you guys dreaming. And moms and dads surrounding your kids with people that are more interested in their dream than they are their athleticism first. So they can understand who is it that I'm dealing with here? Who is this kid? And why should I care about them? So that whoever is around them appreciates the clarity of that child's thinking. And quite honestly, when I say child, I don't mean necessarily 10, 11 year olds. I've got some children that are in their 30s. They're still trying to find out what their dreams mean to them. <laughs> Vincent Van Gogh, very famous painter. He loved painting so much he cut off his ear. There's a debate whether it was painting or a girl, but let's say it was painting. But his quote about dream my painting and I paint my dream. If you've ever seen any of Van Gogh's paintings, I hope we'll show them some of Van Gogh's paintings, especially the ones that we did when he was living in Spain. 
which were a little bit less scary, <laughs> uh, are wonderful pieces of work. But there's a gentleman who, in my opinion, epitomizes that quote from Van Gogh, and that's R.J. McClung. R.J. just recently won the GS, the State of Colorado High School State Championship for GS, and helped, because of his winning, helped his team also win as a team. Now, he made a choice, I don't know if you all know this, but he made a choice not to compete at the higher level. He chose to compete at the high school level because he wanted to have more time with lacrosse and getting prepared for school. Now, because of that, he's getting even more attention by the press, by CU, who knows that he's already, already early registered for CU in the engineering program, they want him on the team. And he had no intention. I mean, he's still not. But he's a great example of dreaming and realizing the reality of your dreams. Okay, lucid dreams. We're clear what those are. Lucid dreams are any time you are dreaming, whether you're awake or asleep. The most powerful lucid dreams are the ones when you're asleep. And you feel like you're in the dream, like, hey, I, I can see my dream, and I'm like out here. That's a lucid dream. Okay? There's two versions of it, mild and wild. Let's not go to the wild part. Stay in the mild part. The mild part is where you can see the colors, you can see the shapes, you can see things moving. So not tonight, you can imagine me doing this in the dream. Kind of crazy. To, no, don't do it. Lucid dreams. Connected, clear, vivid, realistic, and match your skills. So that your dreams, you can make them seem realistic to fit who you are right now. Like you're not an Olympic champion, are you? No. Not a gold medalist. You could be. You, you could be, right? So let's keep it realistic and it matches your skills but work hard to make your skills better and better. What about the wild dream? Well, the wild dream, mom and dad are gonna have to help you with that, or brothers and sisters, if they're hanging around your bedroom with you, when you jump out of your bed, screaming and yelling, you know, or just, okay, here's the strategy. Here's the strategy, go find them. Not right now. <laughs> When you have the wild dream, because you need to talk about the wild dream so that you can do what I ask you to, understand it, wrap your arms around it, don't be, get work through the fear and the concern. Well, what is the wild dream? Usually it's when you have pictures and images that are kind of scary. Oh, like a nightmare. Yes, like a nightmare. Okay. Like a nightmare. So here's the things I ask you to do. Imagine, like you're talking about, put your your brain on it and think about it and don't, if you're afraid, fine. Admit to the fear and, and try to work through it. Talk to mom and dad, talk to friends. Hey, I had this really scary dream last night. It was really, it was really colorful though. Big scary dream, but still pretty cool. And then journal it, write about it. And then if it's, a, if it's a dream about what you wanna do and it's part of your goals and it's in your set of skills, Go take action on it. Use that dream as kind of an outline for what you need to do. And go do something about it. We've talked about this before, so this what this next one means is set goals to go make your dreams happen. Okay? Write them down. Put them in your journal. Talk to people about it. He is, he's kind of scary for some people. Running backs, wide receiver, tight ends. Yeah, quarterbacks too. Uh, JJ is, he's, he's a kitty cat. Well, you get to know him. He is with, the, uh, with Houston, the Texans. Uh, Debatable whether he's a nose guard, the middle linebacker, he could be at all those and probably a wide receiver as well. Um, 
But he does this every day prior to practice and every day prior to a game. The breathing, the through the nose, up through the mouth. He and I talk about it quite a bit. He seems to think that strap across his nose is really cool and works well. I think it's just an image thing for him. He just thinks it looks cool. And plus he gets sponsorship money for it, so I argue with him that it actually works for him. Because you know what that thing's supposed to do is stick on your nose and, and spread it open because it's sticky. Well, are you looking at his nose? No. <laughs> He's got a big nose. Uh, it was very difficult to get JJ to, to meditate. Uh, he was also disagreeing in disagreeing with me that he dreamed while he was awake. Until one day in the locker room, he was kind of. Have you ever done this before? Have you looked looked like this before? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's I'm awake dreaming look. He kind of looked like that, except worse than that. Ah. Yeah, hard to imagine he's worse than that, but he was. So, <laughs> can you imagine how big his neck is? From that picture, he's got a big neck. So he's sitting on a bench like this. So I come up behind him and I just, I get real close to him and I just grab him by the back of the neck and I start doing this. And I, I was watching my watch. I said I was up this way because I was watching my watch like this. But I'll stand like this. <laughs> and. I was timing how long it would take for him to actually acknowledge that I come out of his dream state to recognize that I was massaging the back of his neck. And finally, I just felt his head tilt down a little bit. And he said, you know, I'll give you about four hours to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, now do you believe me that you dream while you're awake? He says, yeah, it's really kind of, kind of spooky. I said, that, that in itself could be a dream. So we've gone, we've come a long way <laughs> with his recognition of who he is. But I can tell you that in the last three years, if you've watched JJ and the Texans, his level of awareness of who he is has improved dramatically. People equate it, when the, the announcers equate it to, man, he is fast. He's, he's working like a rookie. He's so fast. Nice. He's just more aware. He's still old. He still does all the whirlpool baths and all the stuff to get himself recovered. But because of his mindset, because of his imagined, imaginary strength and power now through visioning and, and understanding, wrapping his arms around dreaming through meditation, he can visualize who am I? Why am I here? How do I get to where I want to go? It's not somebody telling him where to go. So there's a cautionary tale for moms and dads with coaches. Get engaged with coaches and listen to how they talk to your kids. If they're talking to them in a way that sounds like they're telling them what to do rather than instructing them on how to do it, you got a problem. Because the, the athlete is not putting their own brain around what is being said to them instructionally so that they can then make it their own. You know, we can talk about, uh, I, I don't know all the technical pieces about skiing, but you know, the downhill ski and how you come into it with your hips pitched or turned or whatever you're doing, turn. But every athlete has to make those movements, those skill things their own. And therein lies the difference between coaching and instructing. So, they need to help the child dream and be visual within the dream that fits them. So take action. What's another word for repeat? Um, Starts with a P. You said it earlier. What do you, what do you have to do a lot to come to really get going on? Um, practice. Practice. Exactly. <laughs> Practice. Over and over again. And sometimes, here's the measuring stick. Everybody around you will know you're, good, you're getting this when you're the one going, Coach, Coach, come on, come on, come out here with me, come on. And you've already done three hours of practice. And you're the one grabbing them. 
Come on, let's go, let's go. That means you believe. You've got the image, now you believe. And you're taking action on it. That's when this really becomes real. So that's your barometer. Okay, so I've, gone, I've taken you through mindful meditation. Just going to review it. When we did the little close your eyes, breathe, that's, that was the beginning of mindful meditation. It starts with diaphragmatic breathing. That's through the nose, out through the mouth. Okay, usually both feet flat on the floor. Don't lay down when you meditate. It's not as effective. You want to have good posture. Chin slightly down, shoulders roll. Okay. That's okay. The yoga, the yoga seat, the lotus position is fine, but not everybody uses that in an effective manner for meditation. Because you start slouching and getting in the cuddly bear, you know. You become the cosmic egg instead of the lotus plus. <laughs> start thinking about the details of the environment with specific imagery, color, shapes, movement, temperature. When you, when you feel that, when you're in that, you know it's working. You're there. Journal your experience as much as you can. Meditate three to five minutes every night. That was what I talked about with the kids when they go to bed. You can do another session in the morning. It doesn't have to be three to five minutes, but at night, that three to five minutes is a huge positive affirmation for us. Yes, ma'am. When you say journal your experience, how does it help you, you know, in the future? Do you go back and kind of see if you have similarities or why why is the journaling important? Journaling initially is important because it, it's a it's a formation of the thought in a different medium. So it, it gives more detail usually than if they just were kind of oh, just kind of thinking about it. They don't formulate any detail or shape to it. It brings it from the um, existential to a more uh, pragmatic and three-dimensional look when you start writing it down. What really then begins to enhance that and brings it even closer to reality is when they start reviewing it, going back and looking at it. And that's why I'm not very um, picky about what they write in the journal. As far as complete sentences, I'll, I'll take even, even pictures and shapes and forms and stuff because they know what it means. So is it maybe also to remember the details? Because yes. if you don't do it, you forget. Right, so for, mom, for you, for moms and dads, when you look at their journal, if they get to journaling, emphasize more detail, emphasize more color, more shapes, ask them to improve on what they see and hear in their, in their dreams, and feel in their dreams, and capture it in writing. Okay. And those, that's the intent. We talked about that. Oh, sorry, sir. Did you get that? No. Okay. Uh, I want to cheat you on that. Um, I, this, this, I have lots of quotes. You can about imagine how many files I've got quoted. But this particular slide of quotes I love, especially from who they come from. Who knows who Jack, or John Lennon is? Who is he? He is a music guy, for sure. <laughs> Hold off on the dreads. Oh, <laughs> the Beatle guy. There you go. John Lennon, regretfully killed on the streets of New York. But that's a whole other thing. And, and Yoko Ono, and he's got a name. He's just, the one with the dreads. Yes. <laughs> you think about the Asian person with dreads? That doesn't make sense to me, does it? It just doesn't fit. It's counterintuitive. Um, this one, you got, you know who she is, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I gave you a clue. <laughs> um, this is so powerful, you guys. If, if you don't dream, you don't live. If you don't acknowledge your dream and see the details, it's hard to be really thriving in what you do. Excited, really anxious, thrive, do it well all the time. So I encourage you to dream, both waking and sleeping. <laughs> but for moms and dads, I, I, I'm going to offer this guidance in, in discipline. It's got to have some order. But order that fits the child, order that fits the adult. 
so that you can live. Alchemist? Let's break that down. Let's go with just this part. Chemist. What's a chemist? Guy making bubbles with stuff. Yeah, liquids and chemistry and stuff poured in. Scientist. And it doesn't have to be just a guy and a gal, too. That's where we have STEM. A scientist. A scientist. A scientist. Is a chemist. Like a biologist is a scientist who's not a chemist. So chemist and alchemist is then what? Think of put another L with that. All chemists. There you go, we're getting close. What do you think? Exactly. Yeah, the, an alchemist is somebody who's very curious. I am very curious. They happen to be a little bit more focused in every all aspects of the scientific world, but Paul was a very I, I just I like this for a lot because it talks about demystifying fear. You're gonna be afraid. Is there ever a hill you're afraid of? Sure. I, I Look, I'm, I black diamond snowboard, but there's still hills. Cotton Bowl on that one ridge when you're facing south, and the drop off is like, like that, it still bugs me. I, I do it, it still bugs me. Because it just, I don't know, it just bugs me. <laughs> but I, over, I overcome it. So do you think, is that kind of anxiety? Uh, you know, there is only one thing that makes it impossible to achieve. And you have fears, or you just start freaking out and cannot move forward? We have a precedent because of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that it's a, look, there's leadership types and leadership styles. One type of leadership style is built on fear of those who participate. Mm -hmm. And it's called toxic leadership. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing, because toxic leaders get results. But how long do you want to put up with that behavior of getting results? Is, it, is the result that big that you're going to put up with that kind of negativity? But it's, it's there. So the reality is failure is something that we have to deal with. It's, it's something we need to manage emotionally. But that's part of being human. Exactly. And that's where we put it in a bucket and said it's bad, when it's not necessarily bad. It's just real. It's, it's part of what it's all about, which is why I talk about when you dream, you're gonna have scary dreams. You're gonna have a bad dream. Wrap your arms around it. Because the quicker you can wrap your arms around it, the quicker you're gonna get over it. Just like in a game, in a football game, I've got athletes that get hyperventilated because they didn't handle the bad stuff very well. And they come off the field going, <laughs> We have to adjust them, right, and adapt and get them over that, that hyperventilation. But that was because of fear. They failed and they couldn't handle facing the failure. We get over it. We deal with it. Everybody has their own degree of how quickly they can do that. So as adults, in guiding the youth, one of the biggest things for me is moms and dads not dumping their own desire for success on their kids because that becomes failure. It's that desire to understand who they are as dreamers so that you can help them see the details and get to the reality out of the dreams. So that's why Paolo's quote for me is hugely important. This is one of my favorites. It's on my website. It's all over the place. You cannot solve your problems with the same thinking you use today because things change. So if I, if I, something happened yesterday, and I know what created it, all the things are around it, tomorrow it's going to be different. But I've got that experience, so if I see it happening again, I'm kind of aware. But it's only if you're seeing the details. 
that you're aware. Albert Einstein. There, this one's one of another favorite one. He's Michael Jordan. So, uh, Aristotle was a very old guy, mathematician. He was an alchemist. He was into everything. Same thing with Albert Einstein, but Albert Einstein came a little bit past Aristotle. Do you know what a, a screw is? Okay. Are there different kinds of screws, different sizes of screws? Okay. He designed the screw. He figured out that spiraling something and making it into, like he took a, a cone, a wedge of wood that was a cone, what a cone is, right? Yeah. Big up here and then narrow down here. Yeah. And he decided he was going to cut this, these edges and ridges into the cone because he thought, you know, that could make, because i got to dig this well and I don't really want to shovel anything. I think I need to make something that makes it easier for me not to shovel. And he designed what eventually became something they used for even more reasons. So he was big, he was a he was an alchemist. He was the Michael Jordan of his time. Yes, he was. He was I'm sure you probably right now, dribble a ball too. So if you practice, you get excellent, and if you practice enough, it becomes a habit. Is there anything about your skiing you don't have to think about? Is there anything, when you ski, is there anything you just, do you know you're just going to do it? Uh, yeah. But it just happens, right? What about, what about, what about leaning forward in your turn or, you know, making sure you're down those skis and you don't think about it, right? Because you've done it so many times. That's what this is talking about. The things that you're going to be excellent at eventually become a habit because you continue to practice. That's what that quote means. That's my son. That's my son. That's at Mount Hood. And uh, he loves to snowboard. So he went to um, pro snowboarding school on Mount Hood out there. Um, and this was... <laughs> He did that, got invited, did that, but his job was a professional auto racer. Uh, so in the off, in the, when the snow was still flying, he was in season in February, because he was with the NHRA, National Highway Association. So he was going hair on fire down the track. Um, now he's got five kids and their hair's on fire. I'll read this to you. Connections between the brain and body is natural and constant. Personal excellence is created by mentally, your brain, your mental training, how you, in, you will engage the connection. So you do things you don't think about, okay? On the, on the snow. But when you, can, when you can feel the snow on your skis and you're going as fast as you can, you're now raising yourself to the next level. You've made the connection. I feel the snow. I hear the snow. And yet, it's fractions of seconds are going by. Lindsay Vaughn, you know who she is? Yeah. Hopefully she'll be seeing soon. She says, she says that she feels the snow. So, you say something like that around me, what do you think I'm going to do? Really? Yeah. I'm going to rub the back of her neck. <laughs> uh, so I challenged her. I said, what does that, what does that feel like? What does that sound like? Well, you know, it, it just got that crunch to it. And, and it, it's got that, that feel to it. I said, give me an answer. What does it feel like? Is it soft? Is it hard? Is it sloppy? Is it, what is it? Yeah, exactly. That would, be, that would have been a great answer. Then I, I get it, right? And then I'd say, is it chunky or creamy? Creamy. What? 
okay, see, now, now we're starting to get someplace. Now we can, can help each other about the cognitive thought process and how are you connecting? Well, she couldn't give me those answers. She gave me what she thought were answers that fit. And the next thing you've asked yourself is, why is that important? Why is that important? My first question up when I when we first started was, why are you here? What are you doing when you're here? And that's what I asked her. Now this is a person who when she had surgery on her broken arm, she decided because she thought it felt good, she was gonna do pull-ups. Not good. Now she got lucky. The screws stayed in, the pins were okay, the plate was okay. But the doctors told her, no, you didn't know. So just because you think it feels good doesn't mean it feels good because you may not be in touch with yourself well enough. So even the, the best of the best, like Lindsay Vaughn, are still learning about how to get in touch with themselves and answer the question, why are you here? But she's pretty good. She's pretty good because she's a physical specimen. She works her butt off practicing to be excellent. So, I, in some roundabout way, I said this to, to Lindsay as well as to JJ and others. You gotta put yourself on the skis, in your boots, on the top of the hill, for any chance of having possibilities of, of accomplishing your goals, right? You gotta carry your skis, you gotta bring your boots with you, you gotta you know, say thanks to mom and dad. And there are things you need to do to get yourself in a place to have the possibilities of succeeding and making your dreams a reality. Did you see the, what did you think of her movie, The Climb? Did you watch it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I have any contact with athletes like Lindsay um, is because of, there are things that others don't see that are indicative or problematic of where they're going. Um, so that is an example of another part of her life that doesn't fit. It's not gonna go away. It's part of the business and the economics. So the movie as a, as a piece, great, great piece. Drew a lot of it, 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 it accomplished its goals. It economically accomplished its goal, the goal, theatrically accomplished its goals, but as far as keeping Lindsay on track for where Lindsay needs to be, didn't necessarily. And I've looked at film of both accidents that she had with the leg and then the most recent with the arm, and both of those were preventable. She was in control of both of those. But that's part of the sport, right? But that's also a thought process that they accept. Hey, I'm going really fast. And it only takes a little teeny movement on my part to screw it up and fall and perhaps hurt myself. My belief is your brain is so powerful that you can dream into the reality you want if you practice it enough. But that practice requires you being in a place in your mind to see and open up to all those different slices of the possibility. And she, because she admitted to me with the arm, she knew it was coming. And that right there was the, the, the piece for me to say, then, then we'll work together. Because at that point, I already said no twice. So this is one of my favorite slogans. Maybe it's because I wrote it, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a swipe that came out, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, get interested, stay motivated, and be engaged. I'm interested. I'm interested in you guys. And I'm motivated to be here because I love to see success. Okay? And I'm in 
engage with you even when I'm asking you to do things that are, di that are difficult for you, like sit still, pay attention, but I love it when you give me a piece of fruit. It was awesome. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. So if there's any questions that you want to make sure that others who didn't attend hear and you have them, ask. Because we're live on the internet. Okay. Film. You have a question? seem like they're interested, but they're really not motivated. You know, like, have you, do uh, you have a favorite movie? Is there a movie you liked recently? Oh, yeah. Which one? I don't like it, though. Is there a movie you're interested in? Oh, is that, did you like Moana? Yeah. Okay, so you're interested in it, right? Are you motivated? You've seen it once, right? A couple times. Oh, so you are motivated. So you saw it a couple times. See, that's the definition. Now you've measured your motivation. I saw it more than once. Were you engaged? You're not sure because you don't know how to measure engagement, don't you? How would you measure engagement? Did you learn something new every time you saw the movie? That's it. She said it was a poem, but I don't know if it was a poem. You're off the book. <laughs> You're crazy. You're crazy living that with the movie. But you see, that's one thing. That's one movie. You might go over here to a, a, a book in school and go, hmm, this is not one. Not doing it. So you don't have, you're not always this interested, motivated, and engaged on everything. You have to make that decision. Okay? So that's a great question. Any other questions? Still got them booked in? Moms, dads? No? By the way, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, because I know it's been a long day for some of you. Being on the hill and snowboarding or skiing or whatever you're doing. So thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. And don't forget that too. Say thank you to those people who really work hard to help you be your best. Thank you, Mom. There you go. All right. There's no other questions. For those of you out there in internet land listening and watching us, thank you so much for connecting. I hope you'll connect more to Team Summit. We're going to make this part of our routine scenario for sharing information to help young people be their best in a positive way and charged with the intent that has purpose for going to where? The Olympics. Gold medalist. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>